I'm here this morning at the Veterans Vietnam Veterans Memorial at Capitol State Park. There have been reports that individuals have been coming and defacing the memorial, spray painting it and trashing it. And I heard those reports and I was angry, as I'm sure you were. Memorials are designed to help us to remember the names and to give honor to those that have sacrificed themselves on our behalf. It angers us when we find out there are those that are dishonoring their memories. I'm pleased to say that the memorial's in good condition this morning. The state workers have done a great job keeping it up and it's a wonderful memorial and I encourage you to come and, and uh, to visit it someday. My own interest in memorials goes back to when I was just a boy and my father told me the story of a young man named Finn. My father was just six years old in 1941 and uh, the family was so excited because my cousin Greta had accepted a proposal of marriage from this young man. My cousin's family were a prominent family in Piedmont near Oakland. My great uncle was a prominent lawyer and a member of the country club. My second cousin Bill was also a lawyer and would soon become the superior court judge for the Alameda County Court. They were a prominent family and social standing was important to them, but they eagerly endorsed and embraced young Finn because he also was from a prominent family. In fact, he had recently graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy with honors. He was charming and intelligent and handsome and athletic, and he had a, a, a life full of promise ahead of him. And the family embraced young Finn and they were eagerly looking forward to the day when they could call him one of their own. Of course, it was a time of war. Family was anxious about where Finn would have to serve, but they rejoiced when his orders came in. Finn was posted to be the personal aide to the Admiral on the USS Arizona. He was to be close to the brass and far from the action, a position of great prominence and prestige, a chance of promotion, and, and the family rejoiced at their good fortune. Surely Finn had a great future ahead of him. Of course, it was only a few months after that that the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and young Finn went down with the ship with 1,176 others. My frustration is that I don't know Finn's full name. Finn was a nickname. My father was just six years old and everybody in my family that knew Finn's full name has passed away. I don't know his name. Many of you have been to the USS Arizona and you, you have seen the names of the soldiers, sailors that died there. I have scoured through all of the records uh, of those that have died on the USS Arizona and I cannot find who Finn was. Memorials are designed to help us to remember the names. And yet, in my case, I don't know his name. The most powerful museum that I have ever been to is Vad Yashem in Jerusalem. It's the Holocaust Museum. Vad Yashem is the Hebrew words for a place and a name. The the naming of Vad Yashem comes from the Hebrew prophecy in Isaiah 56 verse 5 where the prophet Isaiah says, Even unto them I will give in my house a place and a name. Better than the name of sons and daughters, I, I will give them a name that will never be cut off. It's a powerful prophecy. Isaiah 55 through 66 are all about salvation and this particular passage God is promising to those, the lame and the eunuch, those that were excluded from the house of God, God promises to them, even unto them I will give in my house a place and a name. God will inscribe their name on the wall of the house of God. Inscribing your name in stone, of course, speaks of permanence and uh, speaks of a, a permanent place. It's really that prophecy is in contrast to Jeremiah 17 where God says to the cowardly and to the unfaithful, I will write their names in the dust. Of course, if you write your name in the dust, the slightest wind blows it away. But if you write your name in the stone, it's a permanent reminder and your name remains. Vad Yashem, a place and a name. 
The phrase Vad Yashem is only one other place used to describe a memorial, and that passage is found in 2 Samuel 18. It's the story of Absalom's revolt. In that story, Absalom has revolted against King David. King David has recovered, and he has gathered his troops together, and he has sent them out to put down the revolt of Absalom as he waits anxiously as a father, half hoping that Absalom would escape, but as a king, knowing that the revolt must be put down. Well, the story goes that Joab, the general, finds Absalom tangled in a tree, and he kills Absalom, and he throws him in a pit, and he unceremoniously covers him with stones. But the, pe the text adds a little parenthesis at this point. It says, during his lifetime, Absalom erected for himself a memorial in the king's valley, saying, I have no son to remember me. And it was called after his own name, Absalom's place. In the Hebrew, it's Vad Yashem Avshalom. What's interesting is that while Absalom said, I have no son to remember me, the Bible says elsewhere that Absalom had three sons and a daughter. Clearly, Absalom did have a son to remember him. I think that Absalom was being kind to himself. It's not that he had no son to remember him. They said he had never done anything worth remembering. And so he tried to build a memorial so that people would remember him. Well, it, it worked in a way. Uh, it's ironic that Absalom's memorial is one of the few memorials that stands to this day in Israel. You can still see it, that conical-shaped monument in the valley outside of Jerusalem. It stood to this day. But Absalom's memorial never fulfilled his hope. Absalom's hope was that his name would be remembered and honored, and Absalom's name has been remembered, but not in honor. In fact, for centuries, Jewish families would take their children out to Vad of Shalom. They would put stones in their children's hands, and together the family would throw stones at the monument. And then they would gather them together and tell them the story to teach the children this is what happens to sons that disobey their fathers. Vad of Shalom has caused us to remember his name, but has not caused us to honor his name. In an ironic way, though, Vad of Shalom teaches us the other thing that memorials demand of us. Memorials demand of us that we give honor. It's so easy for us to forget, so easy for us to take for granted, and so we erect a monument to help us to remember. That's the first thing that memorials demand of us. But the second thing that memorials demand of us after we give honor, is that we live honor. As we come to a memorial and as we see the individuals that have given themselves, we, we give honor to them and then we begin to reflect about our own life. And we wonder, will we live up to their standard? And we go away from these places, challenged to change our life. We give honor and we live on her.